Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, where's Patrick? I think we should we should uh, get started. Maybe Patrick is getting coffee. Okay, Patrick's back. All right, uh, Patrick, I think we're ready to get started. Let me just introduce you, and you can you can kick things off. Um, so hey everyone, welcome to like uh, like another lecture of CUDA mode. Uh, I actually forget which lecture this was. I think we we went like on a like a sort of summer break, but we're you know glad to be restarting things. Um, we're also meeting like IRL on September 21st. So if anyone's like interested in meeting up some of the people on the server, please make sure to apply. Uh, the spots are like quite limited because the space is quite small. Um, regardless, like today, I'm I'm super glad to be introducing everyone to Patrick Zhao. So Patrick and I actually met like a few months ago. And so this has been like a very, very like long awaited talk. Uh, and so today what we're really going to discuss is going to be like around like Intel GPUs and specifically the, the language to program them, which is Sickle. So today we're going to go Sickle mode instead of CUDA mode. Um, in general, like I think it's important. There's not sort of not a lot of content about how to program non-NVIDIA GPUs on the internet. So I'm like super thankful like Patrick uh, came on to sort of like teach us a bit more. So thank you so much, Patrick. And please, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I'm really glad to have a chance to talk with the... Uh, this form, I saw lots of people join and people still have very interested in the low level programming. That's why what I'm very excited because you know, today people are more focused on the large language model in the high level and application level. And also, uh, yeah, less people uh, focused on the low level pro programming and performance optimization. I think it's a very good thing Okay, before start, today's talk is SQL programming and performance optimization. So why we need to learn the SQL? The first question, so SQL, you can think about, is really similar with CUDA. It's another programming language for, uh, for GPU and other accelerators. So the only difference is CUDA is only for the NVIDIA GPU, but SQL is a cross-platform programming language or API. It can work on the different type of device, CPU, GPU. And for GPU, it can work on the NVIDIA GPU, AMD GPU, and Intel GPU. Even you can extend SQL to the FPGA. So that means if you are working on the CUDA, you write the code. Uh, sorry, code are you sharing the slide? Yeah, yeah we, we just see your desktop, by the way, Patrick. Oh, uh, you didn't see my slide? No, no, right now we see your desktop. Like we see the camping ground with the, yeah. Oh, let me share. Maybe just reshare. It was working fine earlier and just maybe just need to restart uh, it. Which one? This one. Oh, this one, okay. Sorry for that. Oh okay, it's working now. Okay, so. Okay, so th that's why we need SQL. SQL is, you, you're programming with SQL, so you save your time. Your code can run on the different platform. Uh, think about the first run, at least you have the correct functionality and you just need some more extra effort to make your code have the high performance on the different platform. So it's one advantage of SQL. Uh, on the other hand, why we need to learn a low language, low level language? Why we don't use treating or other something is very convenient. So that's because the low level programming language and performance optimization is the fundamental fundamental thing of high performance. If you want to write an efficient treat, treating code, if you want to do some high level performance optimization, you have to learn some something in low level about the programming language, about the hardware uh, architecture, something like that. If you ha have that concept, you can write the code very efficiently. You can know where is the bottleneck. I think that's the uh, main reason most of people still need to learn the low language, a uh, low level language, whatever, how, how many portion will be you in your daily work but know that is very helpful. Okay, let's start. Uh, so in this talk, I normally I have three parts. Uh, start with a quick review with uh, heterogeneous computing. And after that, SQL programming. The basic program parallel kernel, 
this is very junior part. So it's for the intra level. If you don't know the CUDA, if you don't know how to programming with GPU, this is part for the uh, for that. So it's normally zero knowledge you need. And after that is a queuing and memory mode. It, it's somehow about the hardware architecture, but because the time limit, maybe I will skip this this part is you you can review my slide. And uh, the third part, is, I think is the most interesting part for the performance optimization with case study. I use uh, uh, interactive operator, which using the DLIM. It's a real operator. I will show you how to fuse different kernel together. How do we get the performance improvement and how do we use uh, providing tools to analysis the performance. It's really important and it's for the media and advantage users. So that should be very interesting. And I also saw someone asking the channel, how, how do we fuel the kernel? Okay, let's start. So first we have a quick uh, review of heterogeneous computing. So we know today we are not only use the CPU, we use CPU plus GPU, CPU plus FP, PGA and other accelerators. That means we use different type of device together. So heterogeneous computing, it means a computer system and approach that use different compute unit, which based on different instruction side and system architecture. You know, if you program on the CPU and GPU, it's totally different. Different programming language, different assembling code, everything is different. You need to write two part of code. Okay, so the, today the ge general purpose of a uh, processor, normally we have two types. One is CPU, another is GPU. It's very more common for most of us. CPU is for general purpose task, and it's also for most of common applications. You may doesn't use that for compute intensive work, just launch some web application and you also can do that for some compute intensive jobs uh, along with uh, Intel's new CPU. They have AMAX. AMAX can calculate a small part of uh, GIM in, in one time. So it's improved the performance a lot. Uh, for GPU, it's for specific tasks, especially GIM convolution, those kind of very compute intensive jobs. It's very fit for GPU. And it, it's also for some graphic and work, uh, visual applications uh, and the com all computation could be in parallel. That's the most advantage of GPU and uh, also high memory bandwidth. Maybe you already know today, the large language model inference, it's really memory bound. So high memory bandwidth really benefit the uh, large language model inference. Okay, so uh, this is a queuing model. Uh, the first is the independent. Look at the picture, you can see this is the GPU, this is the CPU, and the GPU and the CPU are, are physically separate. They are two different devices. They are not in one chip. So most of the time they are interconnect by the main line. So may bot. So that means if you want to access a memory from GPU to the CPU and from CPU to GPU, you have to across PCIe. And the PCIe is a slower interface. So sometimes we will reduce the memory access between different devices because the connection is slow and they have independent memory space. When we programming, we have to consider where is the memory? How do we move the memory from one device to another device? And they have different compute, computing logic and the instruction. So, 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 so Patrick, I have a question like, cause like in, uh, uh, like in older, like no, not older, like just like even like my gaming CPU has like an integrated GPU yet. Like it's not like sufficient to like power games. And so I'm wondering, so what are the trade-offs with like an integrated GPU versus like having it be some, be a separate device that, that you connect to via PCIe? 
Oh yes, that 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 uh, that's a good question. That's really different. But for integrated GPU, it's most for consuming marketing. So people use that GPU for both gaming and vision applications, and also they can use that for some computing tasks. But we suppose, uh, in that case, the computing is not such intensive. They use in integrated GPU for inference for most of time or part of fine tuning. But but in this case, independent most of time for data center GPU, the, those GPU doesn't have gaming and vision uh, component. They are designed only for the computing. So yeah, yeah. So, 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 maybe, so maybe to elaborate here, like what, what would, for example, stop Intel from shipping the equivalent of like a, a 4090 GPU that also has a Intel CPU as like one device? Like, are, like I, I guess, yeah, like my question is more around the design trade-offs of having something be integrated and like, why can't we have a, a high performance integrated GPU? Like, like sort of anything that makes this unfeasible in practice? Oh, I don't know that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that, that's a marketing and uh, they are... Uh, got it, got it, okay. Is that strategy? I don't know that. I, I just talked some about the technical side. Got it, yeah. So so I think that there's Eric in chat saying, isn't this kind of like the Grace Hopper idea? Yeah, like, I think yeah. that, that's what I was sort of getting at. Okay. That's based on marketing decision and strategy. Everything possible, just, just what's the target marketing, what's the target usage. Sounds good. Yeah, sorry for interrupting, but we, we can okay. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Yeah, we have different GPU, uh, include uh, integrated GPU, which share the memory with CPU, both on the one side of RAM. So it's another cat. But in, in today, mainly I'm talking about uh, target for data center GPU, because most of high, uh, uh, high, uh, High intensive computation, like the large language model training, they are using data center GPU. Never use, it's impossible to use integrated GPU. Yeah, the computation in that is uh, a little lower. Okay. Uh, so the first is independent, and the next is dependence. So dependence means we are not working on the GPU totally. We totally forgot the CPU, it's not. We still need to work with CPU. Look at this picture. Most of code still running on CPU. Only the hot pot, hot spot code running on the GPU. Let's say maybe, for example, 49 of code in the initial stage and only 1% of code in the inner loop. This loop is the hot loop. 99% of runtime in here. And after that, we have some clean up, we have the data write back. It's also another 49% of code. So you don't want to move those yellow code to the GPU. It doesn't make sense. GPU is for parallelization, it's for high performance computing. It doesn't do logic, it doesn't control the device. So you still need to leave this code on the CPU. That's why I mentioned in this page, it's still dependence. When you design your program, when you design your application, you need to consider co cooperate two kinds of device. Okay, so it's quick review of heterogeneous computing. Let's go to the SQL programming language. And in the right, this is a book uh, written by Intel engineer. It's most about everything in the SQL, maybe in this book, you can check on this link. It, it's free, so you can download it and read it. Okay, let's see what and why SQL. So SQL is an extension to the C++ language. It provides, uh, it's a free and cross-platform abstraction layer. Uh, you can enable code for heterogeneous and offload processors to be written use modern ISO C++, at least C++ 17. And it also provides APIs and abstraction to found the device, CPU, GPU, and FPJ. I think it's really convenient for you. You just need to use API and 
switch between CPU, GPU, and FPGA if your system have that. You don't need to write the code to access the, them by yourself. Okay, let's go. So this is uh, uh, some slide showing the cross platform features. Okay, so one API and uh, uh, actually SQL is a part of one API. One API includes the uh, performance tuning tools, the compiler, and uh, also some driver, something like that, and uh, which support NVIDIA and AMD GPU. Look at this picture. You write codes with C++ and SQL extension. And uh, uh, one API base toolkit can compiler that into different uh, hardware. This is NVIDIA GPU and AMD's GPU, okay. So, so, so for NVIDIA GPUs, does this eventually code gen into like CUDA or PTX or is it like something else? Uh, it, it's uh, to LLVM. LLVM, oh, interesting. Yeah, and the interface is, I think all of that interface is LLVM compared to uh, common LLVM and uh, next offload to the different kind of GPU. So uh, related to this, uh, like uh, uh, someone's asking by extension, does it require a custom compiler fork a la NVCC? Uh, I'm not sure detail, maybe it need, does it? Uh, I'm not sure, but it, I think uh, you can check the code plays block for more details. Uh, code play extend that to different kind of device. I'm not very familiar with that part. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, we can keep going. Okay. Okay. Next is how SQL works. Uh, actually, if you want to program a parallel and heterogeneous computing, you need three parts. Okay, one is abstraction for access your hardware device. The second, you have a method to move the data. So the data, as I mentioned, the data should be in the different device. You need to manage when the data move from CPU to GPU and when move it back. And the third is how do you express the parallel laser? So if you have these three parts, you can write the parallel. It sounds very, very easy. Okay, let's start the device. Device is a concept in the SQL. It uh, could represent various hardware in one API system. And we provide a device class. It's a predefined method for select and query different device. The, the very, most common device has been included in the one API. So it includes CPU, GPU, and FPGA. Uh, when you programming with SQL, there is a device selector. You can use default select. If in your system you are running on the CPU, the default selector will select the CPU. And you can also specific what device you want, the CPU, GPU, or FPGA. Okay, let's see the first piece of code. Uh, it's quick, simple. First, we use SQL head fill and use the namespace of SQL. And then we use GPU selector. So you can get the GPU on your system. You don't need to worry about more details about how to set up the GPU device in case you have installed the one API toolkit. Okay, this code and uh, we define a queue. The queue is my GPU queue. Uh, so the my GPU queue, you can get device and get information. You can get different kind of device information, device name, how many global memory in there, how many compute unit, everything you can get from this API. Let's show. Oh, and also I have a code base in here. Oh, uh, this is a code link. If you you need to visit the code and play by yourself, you can try. This is my repo, okay. And also you can collect the slide. This the code I'm showing the in this talk in here. Yeah. yeah so, so Patrick, we're only seeing still your slides. Right oh, now. you only seeing the slide. 
Okay, I will, sorry, I just, I will put, put the link in here in the chat, chat, oh, sorry for that. Okay, let's go back to the slide. Okay, so for, for this code, when we compile, we use Intel compiler, ICPX and uh, uh, dash F SQL. So this code is called GPU selector. And when we run a dot out, we get our select GPU is Intel XMX uh, graphic. So lo looks it's easy, right? We have finished one of third part. We, we have get the device. It's very important part. Okay, let's see the Q. Q is another important concept uh, in the SQL programming. Uh, every time we interact with uh, the device, we show the queue. So in the CPU side, you push everything in the queue. And on the device side, they get catch everything from queue. So it, it's a queue in the date structure. Okay, so you submit your work to the queue and the GPU device gets the task from the queue. In here, we create our first queue. Okay. And also, uh, a queue can map to a device and multiple queue can map to a same device. One device can handle different uh, tasks, but you couldn't map one queue to different device. Okay. The next is date movement. Yeah, date movement sometimes is the most important part and it's also uh, before, it looks like easy, but sometimes you need to think about a little more about the performance because we have two independent memory space, right? In here is CPU, GPU, and uh, each one has their own memory space. And uh, when you transfer the data from the host CPU to the GPU, they have two methods. One is exceed, explicit data transfer. That means the program control. When you transfer the data from CPU to GPU and then computing. After that, you transfer data back to the GPU to the CPU. So this is the most common approach when we programming on the for C GPU code. Uh, the reason is, and the benefit is, you know, when we need this memory, so you can do copy ahead the computation. So when computation come, all data is ready. You can use and consume data immediately. And after that, you switch to other computation and the data right back to CPU could be in parallel with computing. So in this way, you don't have to wait the memory ready, right? So it's really good for the high performance. You totally use the system bandwidth and compute with uh, resource. Uh, another approach is implicate data trans transfer. Sometimes your code is based on the logic. So when the logic is true, you use this data. The logic is false, you use another data. So if we, before the wrong time, we don't know what data we want, right? Actually, you don't want to copy all data to the GPU. Maybe in the wrong time, you only assume a little part of data, but maybe you, you need to copy 10 or 100 times of data if use explicit method. So in this time, you want to use implicit data transfer. So when you want to access that data on the GP CPU, the data could be automatically matched to the GPU and you only move the part you, you will use on the GPU side. It's also efficient. Even we have to wait the data ready, ready on the GPU side, but you copy less data and you doesn't waste the memory bandwidth. It's also good. Okay, so in the uh, in practice, you need to design your system. You need to consider which state transfer method you need to apply. Okay, uh, so for the memory in the SQL, it's quick extension for the C C++. This is a malloc. You can malloc host this on the CPU. You can malloc device. This is on GPU. If you use the explicit memory copy, 
you set you allocate two sets of memory on the CPU and the GPU. You manage the data transfer from host to device. If you want to use implicit memory management, you just allocate one part. It's called shield. So the first touch, first copy. If GPU first touch it, the data will move to the GPU. If CPU touch it again, the data move to the CPU by demand. Okay, so the explicit memory copy is really like the memory copy in the C and C plus. You just need to add the queue. And uh, this is source from destination. Source is one device, destination is another device. Uh, normally copies from one uh, data structure to another data structure in the same device. Okay, is a uh, uh, code example. We malloc code in the CPU side, and then on the GPU side, we initialize the data on the CPU side, and then copy CPU data to the GPU. Okay, this memory copy, and after that, you can write the real kernel. Okay, uh, next step, I will talk about the real kernel. And then we copy the data back to the host. Okay, and rewrite this part. Okay. This is the execution. We compile it and also execute that. We see the data is, doesn't change, it's from one to nine. But this time, the data is different with our initial because this data is allocated from CPU and copy to the GPU and then copy GPU back to the CPU. It's different. Okay, so finally, you can see we have quickly passed the two part, the how to access the hardware and how to manage the, me uh, the memory and the data. Next, how do we write a kernel? So first question. Oh, uh, so sorry, Patrick. Okay. For, yeah, yeah, so th there's already a few questions maybe on the mm, previous okay. chapter, so let's, let's go over them. So, so Daniel is asking, is there a semaphore data structure uh, do you have data structures that work with both the CPU and the GPU? Ah, uh, see more fit data structure. Uh, so for where for little complicated data structure, I think it's work, but but you need to handle it. Uh, a quick different. You you couldn't only pass uh a point to the device. You need to handle, copy that, something like deep copy from CPU to GPU. Uh, I see, interesting. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, if you uh, use the, uh, something like arrays, array. So you couldn't just copy array, arrays, pointer to the GPU. You need deep copy everything. And uh, related to this, like Udit is also asking, does Stickle allow like offloading kernels um, to NPUs? It comes integrated with Intel's Meteor Lake architecture. Uh, so sorry, could you repeat the question? Um, so Udit is asking, does Stickle also allow offloading kernels to NPUs? Oh, NPU. Yes, I think so. <laughs> but to be honest, I, I doesn't do that before. I only focused on the GPU. <laughs> I think right. it, it's good, but, but I didn't try that before. Yeah, th th there are more questions coming in. So it looks from this is from A. It looks like host and device code can be interleaved in the C code. How does async GPU execution interact with interleaved uh, code like this? So, yeah, so I think maybe they're asking like, uh, how do you know if a command is synchronous or asynchronous by default when you're writing it in the same program? Ah, you, you see here, we have wait, right? You, actually, all of the code is asynchronization mode. If you look at the system level, in the CPU side, you, you launch, offload the kernel, you offload the memory copy, everything is asynchronization, right? So if you want synchronization on the CPU side, you need to add wait, wait that complete. If you are synchronization on the GPU side, it doesn't need if you use one queue because the queue will track the dependency 
inside. So the kernel always execution before the memory arrive, right? And another memory copy back is always depends on your previous kernel finished. But if you use multiple queues, multiple queue like this page I mentioned. Okay, you can use multiple queue to map to the same device. In this case, everything is asynchronization. The developer should manage it the dependency of that. In the CUDA, they have CUDA graph. In the SQL, we have SQL graph. You can create a SQL graph. So SQL graph can track the dependency of different kernel, different memory copy, and then handle that. All right, awesome. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. All right, let's talk about kernels now. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So in here, first question, which part need to be parallel? As I mentioned in the dependency part, the most computation intensive and time consuming part, we should to parallel, we should to offload that to the device. And usually it's within the loop, right? Look at this very simple code, is a sequential execution code. We add two vector to B and C to A, and if we working that in the parallel, let's think about we have an instance, I say an thread or processor. So each one working for one data point. So normally code, super code like this, we launch an kernel instance and each uh, instance, thread instance, will do one data point. So before we need one key cycle to finish it. But in the parallel version, we just need one cycle, right? Because we have one key thread to run it in parallel. So uh, that's the most part we want to parallel is the loop. Okay, so in the SQL, we provide a keyword that's called parallel for. It's very concept direct, it's parallel your for loop. Okay, it's also the code of in the parallel. Uh, and when you parallel a loop, the first thing is each iteration should be complete independent. You couldn't compute the i at plus one and it depends on the AR or the previous result. So it's in that way, every data is dependent. You couldn't parallel that. So you need to check if your loop is completely independent. Okay, let's rewrite our code with the SQL. This is the real code. We replace four to the parallel four. And our data computation reach is one K. So this is one K. And uh, we have index I. I means the work I term. So you can use that as an index. We just write I in here. So we can see from the first sequential code to the parallel code is really easy, right? You even doesn't need to pay much attention and much effort, you can finish your parallel code. And actually in the real world, maybe 90% of the code parallelization is such easy. You just need to replace the sequential four to parallel four. You, you finish your first step. And if the code is easy, it's a memory bound and something, you, you almost finish 80% of your work. You just need to do some further performance analysis. You are done. Okay. So in this concept, the parallel computing is not such complex, it's not such hard. So for people, if you just start the parallel computing, whatever is SQL or CUDA, don't afraid that, just try that, it's, it's easy. Okay, so this is our first and basic parallel kernel uh, we 
In here, we use parallel for this is read, which means our computation read, and the item. This item, besides to use for the index, you also can use item to get more information. Get the ID, what's the thread ID in this group, and get the read, how the computation in this group. Uh, we, if we get read in here, we get N. So sometimes you need to mapping your data from the local, local index, global index. So you need this kind of information. Okay, so this is uh, our code. You remember previously we have finished the memory copy from CPU to GPU. And now we add a real GPU kernel in here. So first we use our cube, my GPU queue and submit. We submit these things to the GPU, right? So the handle is H. So in H, we're doing a parallel for loop. The parallel for loop, we calculate each data with multiple H2. So finally, after that, we copy data back. Oh, in here, we have a wait. We wait, this computation is finished and then copied it back. Okay, look at the uh, output. Our data is doubles for each one. Okay, let me know if any question till now. OpenMP support GPU acceleration. OpenMP, if help it, T, B. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, 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 Patrick, don't worry. Like, I'm, okay. I'm monitoring the questions. I think okay. these are just like people commenting on other questions. Okay. You just keep going. Okay. Let Let's continue. We have used, uh, forty meanings. Okay. Okay. So, let's 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 do some further thoughts. We we have finished our fourth GPU code, right? Everyone will feel it's easy. But let's think a little more. How does the GPU work? And how does our parallel for work? And how those tasks map to the GPU? If we want to control the mapping of those tasks, what we should do, right? If you think of this question, you will find we still couldn't understand that. That's because we just think our code from software level. If we want to understand those questions, we need to understand some of GPU architecture, right? Okay, let's go to the GPU architecture. So this is the GPU architecture of Intel XEMX architecture. I think recently Intel launched several ARPC uh, integrated GPU like Meta Lake and uh, the uh, Lula Lake uh, will be very soon. Yeah, this architecture should be similar with that. You, if you understand why one GPU architecture, you can understand all of that. It's, it's similar, just different in the computation co co uh, co uh, type or something, uh, next network detail. Okay, let's see the, this is a GPU and uh, first you can see this uh, media copy engine. When you do the memory copy, they use the memory uh, engine. And this is L3 cache. The L, you can see L3 cache is shared by all the computing unit. And this is one slice. Slice means we organize some computation together. It will be launched and uh, scheduled together. So the Intel slice is similar with NVIDIA's graph, graph processor cluster. Okay, it's called GPC. And in one slice, we have multiple sub-slice. The sub-slice is uh, equal with NVIDIA SM. Okay. So in, in one slide, we have multiple execution units. So finally, your computation is really mapping to each execution unit. And in one sub-slice, you can see, see all the EU and execution unit share the L1 cache, the shared local memory, and also instruction uh, cache. 
So the subslice is very basic part. And next, let's see the execution unit. In the execution unit in here, we have two calculate unit. And we see in each one, we have four execution, uh, four execute, uh, it's a more small, a small execution unit. Each one can execute one instruction. So in here, if you launch, uh, launch one calculation in a EU, each time the eight instruction, or you can say eight data could be calculate, calculate in parallel. This mode we called CMD. We launch sing, single instruction and uh, apply to multiple da data. In here, we multiply that, we apply that to eight data, right? So in here, you can see we have several thread state regis field. So that means you could launch several thread in a EU in the same time. And this thread switch in the uh, to ALU. So that means in the each time, only one thread is select to execute and other thread wait, wait in here and they will hold their regis, hold their count, count, uh, content. Why we design like this? Th use this way we can hide the latency because if one thread is not ready, it waits the data come back, we can switch to another thread to execute on the ALU, right? So I think most of you have heard the zero switch cost in the GPO. So why it's zero cost? It's because here you have several different thread state, state regions in here. This hold everything. This time you just need to select one to execute. So it's zero cost. You, you don't need to get back the context from memory and everything like that, that cost. Okay. Okay, so in this page, okay. Okay, next step. So when we know some basic uh, architecture of GPU, let's look at work item. Work item is a basic computing gran granularity, which be mapped to the ALU execution. So in this code, Okay, let's continue here. Okay, this, this is our code we have shown before, right? We have multiple data. So each data is specific by work item. So each work item working on one data. So think about our architecture. So how GPU execution? The GPU doesn't execute the data one by one, right? It execute by eight, because our ALU, our ALU lens, uh, our CMD lens is eight. So that means in the execution, real execution, every eight data has been combined together and execute on the execution unit, right? And what's a work group? So work group, we have organized multiple uh, work item together to launch that in one subslice, right? So that means if you launch a work group, your work group shouldn't be too small. If your work group is very small, you don't have enough work item, you couldn't fulfill all of those EU, right? Look at this, we have 16 EU, each EU at one time can calculate eight data, right? But in the EU, we still need an, another seven or several number different different GPU architecture to handle, to hide the thread switch. So you need time another eight. So if you want fully use a sub slice, you need 16 EU times eight data per ALU and eight and times eight thread, at least you need 
this number of data to fully use your execution unit. Okay, so that's the basic logic. And with that, we, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Uh, previously, in this data, you, in this program, you can see we just specify the reach and work title. Do we know how large our work group? We don't know. The compiler decides that. So this is very basic uh, parallel kernel. So now, we, we have no, we need to control the number of work item and the number of data long to the sub slice and long to EU. So we, we want to do more better works than compiler. In this time, we need to control. Okay, so in the SQL, we have another uh, API, it's called ndreach. Compared with previous one, one, we have more parameter. This parameter specific your group size. So in here, we group, the group size is 64. That means in each group, we have 30, 64 elements, uh, work item in here, right? So let's say if our N is 1K, so we have 64 work item in each work group. So finally, how many work groups we are generate is 1K divide 64, right? So with this way, you know how many work item in a work group, you know how many work group will be launched. So why do we need to know how many work group we launch? Because each work group is only mapping to one sub -slice, also like the SM. So if you launch less work group, uh, for example, if you only launch four work group, that means only four sub slides has a work to run. Another two is empty. So if you're programming the code, you want to get the high performance, at least you need to use all the resource. So you need to create more work group to fully use all the sub slides. And in, the, in each work group, you should have enough work item to use all the execution unit, right? Okay, this part is a little difficult. It's in the middle level. And we begin to consider the performance. We, only, we will not only consider our data and algorithm. We think more. So that's why we need to explicit control the number, okay. So that's, I will skip this. I think you guys got the, uh, uh, what I mean in here. Okay, next step. Let's see the gym. So gym is very basic part. Well, uh, when you learn the parallel computing, Definitely you will learn how to write a gym. Okay, this is a sequential code for the gym. You can see uh, the output C in each output, you compute uh, one row of A times one column of B and each element wise uh, time and accumulate to this output. Okay, if you want to parallel this code, I mentioned we need parallel four. And in here, we have three, four. So let's say this one, two, three. So which four or what four, four we want to parallel in here? I will give audios maybe several sentences to consider this question, where you want to parallel. Okay, let's start. So let's first see the K. Could we compare parallel K? Okay, you can see in K. K is uh, this way, right? You, uh, 
you multiply A and B and accumulate in the C. If you parallel in K, so let's say someone calculate this part and write to here, and someone calculates this part and write to here, right? So this part is same part. What's happening? It's uh, date rates, right? Different thread will write the data in the same part. So your result will be incorrect if you use this direct approach. So it's normally we don't parallel this loop. They, they have uh, dependency and they have the date risk in the output. But look at the first two parallel. They control the different point, right, in the C. So for each point, their calculation is totally independent. So you can, in there, in here, we can totally parallel the for loop, first for loop and second for loop. We want to let each thread to calculate one output. So totally all the C output is fully parallel. It sounds a good parallel algorithm, right? Okay, let's see. This is the CPU version. If we write that with single thread, doesn't apply the OpenMP. Okay, it sounds good. And let's see the GPU version. So uh, in here, we create a work group. The work group size, like work groups, uh, is a square work group. The row and the column is the same size. Now we can see the group. This is a block size, right? We let's suppose M could be divided by the block size evenly, and let's see, this is a local range. In each local group, we calculate the number of block size, time block size, and uh, finally we have how many work groups we have? It's uh, the M divide block size in X direction and uh, N divide block size in Y direction, right? Right, those are number of what group we have. So we set the local range in here and the global range. And finally, we get the global index in the row and column is global index in another direction. So in here, think about we have parallel the two outlier loop, right? So in the kernel inside, we only have one loop left. It's in the loop of K. So finally, all the thread will calculate one part and write it out. So look at this code. I think most of you will think it's too easy, right? We just have a parallel idea how to parallel the output because each outlook, each output is independent. We don't need to consider the date dependency. We don't need to consider date risk. Everything is perfect. We can finish the first version of Jim. Okay, so let's say this is the performance. If we, ah, in here, we show the performance. If we select different size of block size, we see the performance and speed up. Why is there performance speed up? Think of if we just use block size one. So in each work group, they only have one work item. I mentioned in uh, each EU, they are queuing with the uh, length of eight. So that means uh, seven, uh, uh, seven of eight CMD length are waste. We only use one, right? So the performance should be bad. If we increase the block size, we fully utilize the queuing unit. So our performance boost. Okay, that's this part. And the uh, next part is memory mode. I will skip this part and uh, continue on the performance optimization for uh, a real case. This part should be most interesting, I think. Okay, let's let's continue. This is the case study uh, we made 
maybe one or two years ago. It's a it's not the latest uh, example in large language model, uh, but it's also very very useful. And if you understand the mind and the logic inside here, you can use this approach to anything. You you can optimize your large language model inference fusion that's kernels right uh, such as uh, flash attention mha all of that okay so i'm i'm talking about that just because i have the slide for that okay let's see the drm okay this is the drm model and drm is a recommended system it's highly used on the uh, on network company, uh, when you use eBay, when you use Amazon, you collect some item, you got the recommendation. Maybe the back backend use the DRM. Okay, so the DRM have three input, then the future, and then do a MLP. It's a gym and uh, embedding looking up, embedding look up, and after that we do date cut batch multiplication index and cat and finally to the top uh, MLP. So in this part, we call that interaction layers. You can see we have cat, BMM index and cat. Uh, only BMM is computation intensive operator. A cat index and cat are only memory movement. So our idea is we have one calculation layer and we have three data movement, right? Why we don't fusion all of these four kernels together? We, so we can avoid actual data movement. We, we just read data from where they are, right? And we save the memory bandwidth. Okay, this is the initial ideas. We can fuse the memory movement with the computation. So we save lots of time on the date movement. And why we don't use a library to do this? Because sometimes your, the combination of your uh, operators, your layers is very flexible. This time we have these three, next time we have another four layer to fusion. Library couldn't provide so flexible uh, capability lets you doing everything, right? So you have to write that by yourself. And sometimes it's not that difficult. Okay, let's see. Okay, we finish this page and continue. Okay. Ah, this page shows the interaction module fusion. Let's see what's the input. Uh, okay, so input is a a tensor list. They have 27 tensors in shape of 32K times 128. In here, this is 27 tensor in this way, and each tensor with 32K, 32K and times 128. So the data configures direction in this way. This is the fourth row, second row, so data allied in the, in the, in this way. And this 30, 27 data, maybe each one is contiguous, maybe it's not, uh, but I just draw, draw a picture like this. Okay, so the contact change the data layout. You can see the first uh, 120, Eight in here and next in here. So after the data reorder, we move data in this way. This is the fourth row, is the second row, the fourth row. The contiguous dimension first is 128 and next is 27. So this is a contiguous way and this is another way. So the data move to here. So contact totally change the data layout. So you can know, you know in this step, you have to access all this bigger data two times. One time is read and another time to write to a new tensor, right? You have two tensor and visit the bigger data input two times. 
Okay, next is BMM. BMM is uh, in the batch dimension calculation. So in here, batch dimension is 32K. So each data in the batch di dimension is independent. And in the one batch, we calculate this 128 with with itself. So we get one point. So finally, we can get 32K times 27 times 27, it, like this. It's a small one. Because this data is itself times itself. So this data is symmetric, right? So this part is similar with this part. And we only need the upper or lower Tri triangle. So we write this 27 times 27. It's uh, 351 data in one row. So we have 22K batch, right? Each one has one row output. Finally, we write the data in here is 351 times 32K. And finally, we contact another 128 data with, with 32K data together. Like here, if you move this time to this time, you have visit this data one time and copy that to a big data, big tensor and with another. So you, you can see, you repeat access the memory multiple times and all of those is not necessary, right? So that's why we want to fusion uh, those kernel together. Okay, so I leave this page several seconds. You you can understand that it is about the DR model. So if you are not familiar with DR model, it may be a little complicated. Okay, let, let's continue. So before we write a kernel, what we should do? Yeah, so so, so Patrick, okay. maybe just a quick time check. I think we really have like concretely about like maybe 10 to 15 minutes left. So hopefully that's Oh, 10 or 15 to... minutes. Uh, we stop at 1.30, right? Uh, sure, yeah, we, we can do that too. Okay, we have 24, uh, five minutes. Yeah, like I mean, like we still want to leave maybe like a few minutes for Q and A. So so maybe oh, okay, you know, okay. minutes. So let's just let's aim to end by like you know wrap things up by like one twenty one twenty five. Okay, okay, okay. I should speed up. Okay, okay. Uh, before we uh writing a real code, we we should consider what technique we need to use. Uh, today the GP on the GPU we have lots of choice. We have IP sixteen. We have uh, TF32, we have IP32, we have normal IP32 calculation, we have IP16 uh, calculation, we have tensor core and uh, systolic array calculation, right? Lots of combination. We need to consider what we use in our code. So first step, we need a, uh, analysis. So in, in, in this, uh, case, the most important is uh, BMM, is the calculation part. So we start from BMM. Its shape is uh, like this, 32K times 27 times time, time, and we get this. And we calculate how many uh, operators in here. Operator is, uh, this is our output, right? Output, and in each output, we time in the K dimension is 128. And we do FMA with time two. So this is how many ops we need in BMM. And how many memory we need to access. So th that's we access A, B, and C. So uh, this is 32K times A, time, A and B is same. So I will time two and the output. So 27 times 27 this is how many memory we need access. So the, uh, how many ops per admin byte? Per admin byte, we can divide this this to this, get this. And let's assume we use different data type. If we use 
IP32, OK, IP32. We have so many ops. This is how many EU we have. This CMD, CMD write, CMD write, I mentioned it's eight, right? And uh, two ops per cycle and times the GPU frequency and times the EU efficiency. Efficiency. Let's say the EU efficiency is 100. And if you doing that calculate, you can get a time. The EU calculation time is 0.56 uh, microsecond. And if we change IP16, uh, IP16 is uh, two times faster than IP32, right? You just divide two. Looks IP32 is good, right? And if you use D-Pass, D-Pass is similar with uh, uh, NVIDIA's Tensor Core. So it's much faster than normal calculation unit. If we calculate the systolic array, it's, uh, each time it's calculated eight times eight metrics. So it's really fast. You can see the computation time is 10 times faster even than IP16, right? And let's finally, let's see the memory transfer. So the memory transfer, if we use IP32, we use two microseconds. And if we use IP16, we need one uh, point zero microsecond. So till now, what do we get? So doesn't matter if we use D pass or tensor core in this case. It's doesn't, right? Because you can see the memory transpose time dominate all the computation. Whatever you, you finish the computation in the 0 0.2 or 0, 0, 003, it doesn't matter. You need 1.0 microsecond to finish your memory transfer, right? So you don't need to bother the pass and the tensor core. It's complicated. So next question, do we need IP16? In here, you can see whatever the CPU time or the EU time of IP32 and IP16 is half slow, but still slow than memory copy, right? Do we use that? Actually, we don't need IP32 uh, IP16 calculation, but actually we need IP16 memory date time. It's same half time, right? Because we transferred half data. So IP16 is important in here. So finally, we, we get, we don't need systolic array tensor core, and we really need half position because half position save half memory transfer. Okay, in theory, our estimation is a maximum of computation and memory transport. We suppose they can overlap each other, but in real reality, maybe they couldn't overlap such best. In reality, is in the maximum or in the sum of that. If you totally couldn't overlap that, the max time is memory transfer time at computation time. So in the reality, your performance may be in this range. Okay, let's continue. Uh, the first design, we will use a gym previously we designed and uh, each gym calculate a batch. We have 32 K batch. So we just let one work group to do one batch and we use 32 times 32 group size. Okay. So let's see what happened. So this is IP32, right? Uh, this uh, result from VTwin. So if you use, uh, we have lots of uh, providing tools. If you use Kutas, you can use Insight. This is VTwin, they are similar. Okay, use IP32, you can see the EU activity is only 29 and store. Store means you are with the data, the EU doesn't, Nothing can work, have to wait. So it's 64. And uh, when we switch to IP16, you can see the EU activity improve and the store number reduce, right? So why that happen? Let's see uh, the data. So the, 
This picture will show how many data we transferred in here. In IP32, we see from the HBM, we have 100 and gigabyte data transferred to the GPU. And when we change to the IP16, it's only half data transferred to GPU. So that's why the EU spend less time to wait the data movement because we consume less data, the data transfer is uh, latency reduced. Okay, so it's uh, HBM and also look at H3 read. H3 read number is also decreased half, right? Okay, so the performance, we can see the time if with IP32 is 5.2 5 5 and with IP16 is 3.0. And next step, Oh, this step is very interesting. Well, I will let you know. Is is IP32? Is is IP16? So from those data, what we can learn? I will give you several seconds. I don't have too much time. Okay. See, is there any stranger thing or weird thing from this data? Okay, let me continue. Okay, I have give a hint, hint in here in L3 data. Look at L, how many data we read from L3. Okay, so let me continue. So uh, in both case, you look at, we read the data from uh, here, from here, uh, it's 53 gigabytes we read from the global memory, but in the L3, we read 272 gigabytes data, right? So the L3 read is very large. It's three to five times the HBM. What does that mean? So one thing, the good thing is mean you have a good locality. You did hit in the L3 a lot, right? That's a good thing. What's a bad thing? Bad thing is you read too many data from L3, right? We need to reduce the access from L3. If you look at look back at the, our architecture, L3 is really far with our subslice and EU, right? And all the slides, all the EU shares L3, right? It's very far. The latency is also huge. So we don't want to pay that penalty. Okay, yeah, here, okay. So what we can do, so we need to use shared local memory. Our data now have the good locality. So why we don't move that data to the shared local memory? To maintain this locality and reduce the access to the penalty from L3, right? So it's really a good idea. So you have to move your local data from the L3 to uh, shared local memory. Let's look at the data. So this with IP16 without shared local memory, you can see this is shared local memory, the data transfer is zero. And when we use shared local memory, so lots of data transfer in here, and our EU activity increased a lot, and the store decreased because you read data with a local memory. The latency is small, the bandwidth is, is bigger. So it's good, and you can see the L3 load uh, number is similar with, oh no, it, it's not, it's ratio. Okay, it's ratio. And uh, this is the page. Okay, you can see this uh, uh, data read from the HBM from, from the L3. So when we apply the shared local memory version, the total data load from L3 is decreased, right? It's similar with uh, HBM data number. That means you only read data from HBM23 one time. And after that, you load what you need to the shared local memory and re you reuse all the data in the shared local memory. 
Is that cool? Yeah, it's it's really good. So we get performance boost. From here, you can see we have another boost from three to two, right? Ah, okay, I think, do we have enough time? Let's go there quickly. So from previous slide, we know actually in this gym is special. We accumulate itself. So we have one source of A. So we change the data from one source. Both and B is the same data. So we change to one source. So total data load half and we fuse output index. Ah, uh, okay. After that, we can see this is a, uh, this is the data from uh, framework and the original BMM execution time from Vanding is a, uh, our high performance library similar with CoDNA. So you can see their performance is good. When we write by our SQL, our performance is bad than the library. It makes sense because we are not library. Library guys write code very efficient. We are not the, okay. And when we uh, fuse the index, fuse the index together, and this time, finally we see uh, the total performance is not improved too much because our gym is not efficient as library. So yeah, and then continue. Ah, okay. I don't have enough time. Maybe okay. I can I can stop in here, and uh, let's see if we have any question. Cool. Uh, th thank you so much, Patrick. Um, yeah, I really appreciated like a lot of the technical depth. I, I guess like there there were like a, a few questions here. Mm -hmm. Um, so Daniel, for example, is asking like, what is the sampler and uh. I see it, it has L1 and L2, so maybe just more detail. And what unit was that measuring? Oh, it's used V-Twin. V-Twin use hardware uh, sampler. It can, yeah, it, it's like the insight. Just gets the uh, data from the hardware profiler. Uh, I forgot that name. <laughs> it's hardware provide. All right, and then on slide 55, uh, what is meant by EU efficiency? Oh, EU efficiency means how many times EU is working and how many times it doesn't work. That that means have 45 times EU is is working and another 55 times the EU is idle. idle. Not, nothing comes wrong because they are waiting for the memory arrive. Yeah, so like Daniel's asking execution unit. Is that like what it stands for? EU. Uh, execution unit. It's just <laughs> the execution unit. They are real, acute, and uh, progress the instructor. The instructor will really map into the execution unit. All right. Well, uh... I don't think I see other questions in chat. So, so thanks, so thanks again, Patrick, for for this awesome talk. Like, hey, folks, like, please make sure to like you know shower Patrick with some emojis. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, Patrick, you're already being asked. Like, if people have any questions about Sickle, they're asking if you're going to be like on Discord to answer questions. I guess like you can also make your slides available, right? And then yes, right, right. Can ask more questions. Yeah. All right. Awesome.